out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Well, let's let's see if I can't move this thing. I think you can. There you go, there boy you go. Joe. Why think he's going? I think you do. Welcome to the 465th episode of Energy Week with George Harvey and the astonishing Tom Fennell, who is Tom. Huh? In the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot Man, my cue here. You forgot. <laughs> You've done it 400 times. Okay. Um, this show is based on uh, energy news. It comes up at my blog, geoharvey.com. You can go there and read all about it. Or yeah, you can go down. Good, there's some good stuff on here. We're, yeah. I, I'll try to mention it. You Absolutely. Go to the link and pick it up because uh, you could be busy with some of the stuff we're you, talking you about. You could. So you can go down below. On, I guess it's that way, that way, <laughs> that way. It's that way. Go down and you can click on the uh, on the on the file that uh, has all our stuff, which is a document, and it has links in it. Or you can go to the link that's down there that goes to the the WordPress um, blog where all of the stuff is accumulated. If you want to read about any of these in in more detail. And um, I, some of them are well worth reading. Some of them are worth reading. Some of them take a long time, too. Some of them take a long time. <laughs> some of them you'll fall asleep in the middle. <laughs> Hopefully not many. That's life. That's life. <laughs> okay, we're going to start with um, uh, a news that comes up on the uh, 24th of March on Thursday, which is a week ago today. This is an item from Clean Technica. Uh, yes, Shell <laughs> is offering Tesla and other EV subscriptions in Germany. Wow. Shell Oil Company is offering Tesla and other EV subscriptions in Germany, so you can subscribe to a car. That was one of my points that I'm going to mention. Yes, oh, yeah. I'm going to car put, subscription. put the picture up so that you can get that up there, Tom. Oh, let's, let's get the I'm, picture up While I'm reading, there. yeah. yeah so the people can see what this looks like. This is a Shell order page. You can get that. You can get the details on a, getting a subscription to a, an electric vehicle. Shell Oil, Oil Company, and is offering these subscriptions in Germany. Oil and gas companies need to evolve if they want to survive the eventual EV revolution. And Shell may be leading the way. This isn't to say Shell is one hundred percent a good company, but it is trying to make some progress. It seems to be. And my question here is subscribe to a car? That's what they're doing. <laughs> it's a customer chooses their desired EV and could order it without a down payment, the final installment, or a starting fee. They then make monthly payments. And then it tells you what, what cars you could choose from. And a final takeaway on that is when oil companies start selling EVs, you know that the EVs are winning. <laughs> I they guess are. They do. They're inevitable. They are inevitable. There's no question about it. So, do you have more on that, or is that enough? No, that was all I had. Okay. Oh, go well, to the next one here. Our next one is um, a picture of a bewildered guy. I be this is Jamie <laughs> Dimon, one of the richest men in the world, isn't he? And his, this story comes from CNN. Jamie Dimon to Joe Biden. <clears throat> Quote. We need, a not, we need a Marshall Plan for the U.S. and European energy security. Yes. Now, now you find out who Jamie Dimon is. He is the, he is the chief um, uh, executive officer of J.P. Morgan Chase. I bet he makes more money in a year than I've made in my entire life. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I'd be surprised if he made less. I wouldn't less. be surprised if he makes more money in a day than you made in your entire life. <laughs> well, you know, that's what happens when you're lazy and you, you know, just never show up for work. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon urged President Joe Biden in an off-the-record meeting this week, which happened to be recorded, um, <laughs> to develop a, quote, Marshall Plan, end quote, 
to fortify energy security of the United States and Europe, a fam person familiar with the matter confirmed to CNN. So maybe it wasn't really recorded. It was just remembered. Well, the original Marshall Plan for the younger people in the audience here was a comprehensive program to rebuild America's de um, Europe's decimated infrastructure in the aftermath of World War II. Yeah. And they took a they took a beating, even though oh, they won. Yeah. They oh, still gosh. took a beating. This meeting was spurred by Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, sending energy prices surging, yeah. which we'll be talking about we will. again. Diamond urged Burden, <laughs> Diamond <laughs> urged Biden to focus on four areas, and I'll quote them: increase natural gas production in an environmentally responsible way. I don't. I, is there such a thing? Uh, I I hope so. <laughs> Building additional liquefied natural natural gas facilities in Europe, investing in new technology for hydrogen and carbon capture resources. We'll be touching that base on that one again, and streamlining permitting for renewable alternatives like wind and solar. Yes, Th they're all good hits. They're yeah, all, they're all good hits. I think hits. so. I knew a man once who was a British MP. Uh huh who uh, was in Germany when the United States announced after the Second World War that it was going to back the Deutsche Mark. Oh, yeah? And prior to that, he had um, been told when he went to Germany, take a carton of cigarettes with you. He said, I don't smoke. And the person said, doesn't you can, matter. You can buy her with them. Take the cigarettes. Yeah. So he took the cigarettes and forgot about them, left them on a mantle in his hotel room. And when the, when the woman who was cleaning up the hotel room was in there for the last time before he was about to go out, which was before this announcement, he said, oh, I don't need those. You can have them. <laughs> and she was absolutely flabbergasted. She just got a week's pay. <laughs> a, a month's pay. A month's pay, wow. A month's pay. Yeah, she said, well, it wasn't a month's pay. She said it would support her and her son for a month. Yeah. Ten packages of, cig uh, of cigarettes. Amazing. Isn't it? Okay, so um, on our next item is from Clean Technica, and we have a picture of a postal vehicle. Let's see vehicle. if I can't get that picture up here. Well, that's a good idea. And it looks like a postal vehicle to me. A bunch of them, actually, but this one happens to be plugged in. You know, they didn't mention it here, and it's it goes counter to the article. But why don't they just put solar panels on the roofs of those things? <laughs> yeah. That would make sense, a flat roof. Yes, absolutely. Well, U.S. PS, United States Postal Service Inspector General study favors electric vehicles. The Office of Inspector General for the United States Post Postal Service has issued an ex extensive report on the purchase of new postal vehicles. It states nearly 99% of all postal delivery routes in the United States could be served reliably by battery EVs that would cost less cost to less. buy, <laughs> less to fuel, less, less to, to maintain. maintain. Bing, bing, bing. And, the, and they and don't do it. This postal guy, uh, I think his name is DeJoy, had said that he wanted to order 90% of the new vehicles to be powered by gasoline. Yeah, that's what the article says, 90% yeah. gasoline. And now it looks like somebody is figuring out a way to get around his signature and get the, because it's the same company supplying them one way or the other. And so they're going to be supplying both the electric and the gasoline versions. And Well, that, that's crazy. I mean, it's... It's crazy. Well, it, somebody has figured out a way that they can get uh, more than 10% of them to be electric. And apparently the, the great majority of them is well, going to be... Well, Congressman Connolly of Virginia is probably who you're talking about. Yeah. Has introduced the, <clears throat> quote, Green Postal Service Fleet Act. <laughs> a bill that would block the Postmaster General's contract by requiring at least 75% of the new U.S. Postal Service vehicles be electric. That's or probably otherwise what I'm emission about. free. Yeah. And this is interesting enough. This bill is being held up by Joe Manchin. <laughs> okay. What else does he do besides hold things he up? He makes a lot of money on fossil fuels. Yes, he, he does. You know, yes, he does. That's America, what he's doing. this is a quote. This, this comes from the article. America has the best government money can buy. <laughs> Thank you very this, much. This catastrophe of a contract proves it. 
Yeah, I think so. Should we go on? Yeah, I think we can. We can't okay. dance. We Friday, a, March 25th. Yeah, Already. Already. Um, we have a picture here of an airplane taking Looks like off. an airplane to me. Let's, let's get it up, see if everybody agrees. That's an airplane, isn't it? I think it is. That's an airplane taking off, as a matter of fact. I think that's what it is. <laughs> Flights are taking huge detours around Russian airspace. Here's what that means for the climate crisis. This is from CNN. In response to sanctions for its invasion of Ukraine, Russia closed its airspace to airlines from dozens of countries, about 400 flights a month. What is or, a no-win situation, isn't it? Well, you know, <laughs> you know let me, let me finish. Let you finish what you're we'll saying. We'll talk. About 400 flights a month are being forced to take a wider berth, each using significantly greater amounts of fuel. Well, the new routes are leading to more time in the air, mm -hmm. more miles flown, and more fuel burned, and it's which like, means more emissions. Yeah, thousands of gallons per flight in many well, cases. Well, if the aviation industry were its own country, it would be number six in carbon emissions. Oh, man. But the, <laughs> the thing flight, is, what, yeah, go ahead. The flight from Tokyo to London now heads east over the North Pacific, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, adding two and a half hours of flight time and burning about 5,600 gallons more fuel. Mm -hmm. Bingo. That means emitting an additional 60 tons of CO2, which is the same amount of carbon dioxide as the average car driving six times around the world. Have you noticed, by the way, that the things that Putin is doing to retaliate for the thing for the for the things that have been done, yeah, you know, make it the make situation it worse. <laughs> worse for him. Really, yeah, you know. Now this happens not to be a, a very obvious one of them. Well, for one thing, it takes more fuel to carry the weight of the extra fuel. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, th this is a the the idea that he would tell us that we can't have electronics or cars that they make because because we're not taking um, be, because of the of the sanctions against his his uh, oil and gas industry means that in instead of getting less money he's getting much less money <laughs> so it's almost like he's doing sanctions against himself and I, you know he probably hasn't figured that out yet i don't know this man <laughs> from what i can tell he 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 is lacking some intelligence. Let me put it that way. <laughs> All right, should we go on? Yeah, we should. We should. Let's uh, let's see us both again. As we say, the Great Barrier Reef, Australia confirms a new mass bleaching event. This is bad. And I'm going to put up a picture. This of is from the BBC. There is the Great bleached... Barrier Reef, and it's all white. It's all yeah. bleached, isn't it? And that actually is not a picture of the Barrier Great Barrier Reef. It's a picture. It's a of different a reef. Different reef. Uh, Australia's Great Barrier Reef is being devastated by another mass bleaching event. Officials confirmed, it is the fourth time in six years that such severe and widespread damage has been detected. Prior to 2016, which, by the way, was six years ago, only two mass bleaching events had ever been recorded. Do you think things are getting worse, maybe? I would say. Matter of fact, we're, ready, we're readying ourselves up for another one, I think. The Great Barrier Reef, by the way, is one of the most diverse, biodiverse, ecosystems in the world. Yeah, except for Stretching today. over 1,400 miles off Australia's northeast coast. What did you just say? I said, except when it's dead. Except when it's <laughs> dead, right. Bleaching, for those who are uninformed, is caused by warm sea temperatures. It occurs when under-stressed corals expel the algae living within them that gives them color and life. Which is kind of like throwing up. You know, that you're expelling something. <laughs> they can recover, but only if conditions allow it. Yeah. And the takeaway here is urgent action is needed if the world's largest reef system is to survive. I don't think this is going to survive in its current form. I think well, it's there interesting. Are People are aware of it, but they don't seem to be doing concerned anything. by it. I don't know. This is scary. But nevertheless... This it, is one of Australia's it, national wonders. It reminds me a little bit of, of 
Mark Twain saying everybody talks about the weather, but nobody ever does nobody anything does about it. Nobody does anything about it. Um, okay. Well, let's see what we got here. We got another picture coming up briefly here. We do. Here. This is a, an interesting and thing. It was a tall picture, so I had to put the caption off to the left. And we'll see the picture there. There you go. And that <laughs> is a picture. <laughs> it's a picture. And there is another picture. It's part of the same picture. Yeah, and that and thing at the bottom I can't there. get it all on the same screen. Well, I got it on the same screen. Yeah, it's all there. It's, that is an Archimodo EV. It sounds like a Japanese name, doesn't it? Yeah, it is, but I don't think it's ja Japanese. I don't think it's Japanese. Well, this Directed Technologies will test an Archimodo EV in Australia. So I think it's an Australian company. I think it is. Um, I think Moto is not like Yamamoto. It's like motors. I think you're right. <laughs> this is from Clean Technica. Directed Technologies uh, and Archimodo announced testing of Archimodo's fun utility vehicle. And, and that's what you're looking at. That's a fun <laughs> across Australia. By it's, the way, fun is an acronym. Yes, but I don't know what it says, but it's an acronym. It's a fun utility vehicle. <laughs> no, that's fuv. I don't know. <laughs> you got me. I'm I'm caught there. Um, quote. This is a quote. It's staggering to think that you can make a hundred. Mean Lean Machines, which are those machines that Tom just had up. We should back up there. Put it back up, yeah. A hundred of those for the same amount of extracted material that goes into one Hummer. Isn't that something, huh? It's and for amazing. those who want to know what a Hummer is, it's a civilian version of a military Humvee. Yeah. It's an is, ATV. It's sort of an oversized Jeep. It's an oversized, oversized Jeep. The oversized, is, oversized John, Jeep. Hummers are huge. It's big. Yeah, they're big. But <clears throat> that little guy that you see on the screen comes in a couple of different flavors. And one of them is a, is a thing where there's a driver in, the, in a single front seat, and then you can have one passenger in the back. Uh, there's an interesting uh, leaned down version of it. Yes. And they call it the arc, they call it the mean lean machine. Yes. And it's a deliverator, which you're looking at there, without the box. Without the box. It's a small footprint Archimodo vehicle. Yeah. It's you know, it's like a one man it's almost, it's almost like a sled it's, with wheels. Well, <laughs> technically in Vermont that would be a motorcycle. Well, yeah. yeah. With the motor is a motorcycle. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But a mean lean machine is a whole level of efficiency improvement in terms of mobility, weight, and cost reduction. The idea that the same amount of extracted materials to produce the GMC Hummer is enough for two Tesla Model Ys or 100 mean lean machines is mind-blowing. Yes. Okay. Let's move along. We're up to Saturday, March twenty sixth. We have a picture here of Robin's eggs. Looks like a looks like a picture. Yeah, and you know, I'm struck by the fact that the egg on the left looks so much bigger than the other. <laughs> but it does, doesn't it? It sure does. I think it's a matter of uh, perspective. Really. No, I think that really actually is bigger. Is bigger. Yeah, yeah, eggs are not all the same size. This is from CNN. There was a woman in <clears throat> in Prattlebury whose name was Robin Zegg. <laughs> Robin Zegg. I think she gave herself that name. Sounds but like her, it. She was walk, she was ro walking around Brattleboro, posting on I Brattleboro and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Robin Zegg. Okay. Well, CNN. Birds are laying eggs earlier, a study shows. Scientists blame the climate crisis. Yeah. Using collections of egg samples from modern and Victorian eras, Researchers found that several bird species in the Chicago area nest and lay eggs almost a month, a uh, full month earlier now than they did a century ago. Their study appeared in the Journal of Animal Ecology. Well, scientists look at rising temperatures to explain this shift in behavior. Yes. However, the insects that young birds feed upon are not keeping up. Most of the birds in the data eat insects, and those insects eat plants. So the whole ecosystem is interconnected. Yes. So they're getting out. They're they're, they're getting hatched, but they got nothing to eat because the insects aren't there yet. Yeah, and that's you know the birds do the birds act according to the te temperature, and the 
some of the insects act according to temperature, but some don't. Some uh -huh. some things in 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 um, nature organize themselves depending upon the angle of the sun. Well, they're surviving, but things are going to change. Yeah. Insects that young birds feed on are not keeping up. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. The stresses, these stresses haven't necessarily doomed anything to extinction, but they're definitely changing the conditions and that all these organisms are for, dealing with. Yeah, they're making it harder for the that birds. That may to... have really important ramifications. Right. Okay. And anything like that has potentially big implications yep. for us as well. Our next item is from CNN, and I have a picture here. I bet here. I can find that picture. I'll bet you could. I bet I can, but this I This picture is... I are wrong. Uh, you I see where your cursor is? There, You just drew it across the picture. Oh, uh, there it is. There it is. Okay, that is a picture of San Juan. Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, and that is a, a battlement of some kind that that's on. Um, and this is from Clean Technica. 100% renewable energy in Puerto Rico. How to get there? Yeah, an analysis led by National Review, Review Renewable Energy Laboratory. That's what NREL. Yeah, we call that NREL. Is underway to supply Puerto Rico with options for achieving a renewable, reliable, and equitable um, electric power system. The goal is to de-risk Puerto Rico's investments in modern, intelligent, and affordable grid infrastructure. Those words are just too big to pronounce. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, the Department of Energy yeah. in Puerto Rico signed an MOU. You know what an MOU is? I do. I actually do. It's a memorandum of understanding. It means we want to remember that we understand. So when we forget <laughs> later on, we've got a piece of paper to look at. Well, he had his memo outlines accelerated work to strengthen Puerto Rico's energy resilience and enhance initiatives for clean energy. They, Can't argue with that. They have been working with this since that hurricane. I yes, forget which they one. Have. Was it Maria that hit Puerto Rico? Yep. And, and it, it was just, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Well, it was all disjointed. They didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, I was talking to somebody who was in Puerto Rico at the time. They said the winds... At, at the at the house they were in, started to scream like some evil monster. Wow! And it just went on for something like thirty six hours, and you know people were people were scared. Well, this NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, found that resi residential solar and energy storage installations will greatly enhance electricity reliability and resilience of energy infrastructure in the face of extreme weather. There you and go. Puerto Rico gets extreme weather. It sure does. Distributed solar, solar photovoltaics installed on all residential rooftops in Puerto Rico would generate 20 gigawatts of power. Gigawatts <laughs> is gigawatts. That's a lot of power. Yeah. That is far exceeding current. That's enough to fry a lot of those eggs. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay. Should we go on? Yeah, we should go on. We got another picture. We have a up picture here. here of a pair of BMWs. They America's are. first 5G connected car is here, and it's electric. I'm confused by that because 5G is telephone, not cars. That's correct. These guys can talk to the telephone system while they're driving around without using the telephone. The car is the telephone. Yeah, the car is the telephone. Things are getting very strange. BMW is introducing America's first 5G-connected cars, the BMW i4 Sports Sedan and the all-electric BMW iX. The pair will be powered by T-Mobile's Magenta Drive for BMW. <laughs> Service plan as part of an agreement with T-Mobile to bring unlimited calling and 5G data to select BMWs. Now this explains my, 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 my confusion. Cars are transitioning from just a mode of transportation to an extension of home and work. And they've always been that. Well, they're, they're <laughs> more than that, more, more likely. That. People on the go are depending upon premium connectivity more than ever to power personalized in-car experiences and entertainment, hence the 5G. Yes. 
To that end, Magenta Drive offers drivers unlimited data that turns their car into a mobile hi-fi watch. <laughs> Wi-Fi hotspot. <laughs> Wi-Fi hotspot. Wi-Fi. Wi Not Hi-Fi watchbot. Right. <laughs> Connects all their in-car devices and offers unlimited voice and voice over the internet. This calling. Is, I find this scary. Tom. All at super fast speeds. I find it scary. And the reason is because <laughs> it, concentrates the, it concentrates the technology into such a narrow place. And if something broke, like if... G5 suddenly broke. Would you're, you out even, of, you're out of luck. Would you be able to drive the car at all? That's a good question. You may not. You know? They claim the customers will ha have access to 5G coverage across 96% of America's interstate highways and will offer service to BMW iX and i4 Boyer. I for buyers for approximately twenty dollars a month. Well, this tells us something because it, it, this if, is ongoing. If they are, if they're connected on ninety six percent of the highways, they're not connected on four percent, which means the cars have got to be able to drive without this stuff. Well, this is the interstate highways. Yeah, there's ninety six percent of the interstate. But it, we're going to have five G on Elliott Street. We're going to have a bunch of them eventually. On, soon. You think soon? Yeah, soon. You know this, or you just... That's what I've been told. I don't okay. know it for a fact, but that's what I've been told. They're well, putting these things in everywhere. Yes, they are. Well, let's move along here to Sunday, March 27th. You really want to get there? Now, listen, I, this particular picture, picture which you batteries. should put up, and, you know, I want you to tell me honestly. Uh, like you're radios. an electrical engineer, <laughs> and you tell me, can you understand anything of what you're seeing there? Well, sort of. Those round cylinders that you see there are each individual batteries. Yeah, and there's, there's and it, and wires in there that presumably conduct electricity. And they hook them together. Well, the, the, the wires are carrying information. Huh. Okay, the, the electricity carrying wires you can't see, and they're heavier than that. Oh, that makes sense. And then each one of these things has got its own circuit board on the top to... to Explain what the heck's going on. To yeah, make, I guess. To make what's going on go on. Yeah, I guess. Okay, this is from Clean Technica. Well, what the article says is those are lithium ion batteries, and they're batteries of batteries, yep. and the image is from Argonne Laboratory. And what it says is, and I quote, pivotal battery discovery could impact transportation and the grid, overcoming performance decline. One of the more promising candidates for new battery technology is sodium ion. Remember that. Sodium, yeah, sodium ion. ion. We've heard about lithium ion. This is sodium ion. It is attractive in part because sodium is cheap. It well, of is. course it's cheap. You go down to the co-op and you buy table salt. <laughs> and, you know, half of what you're buying there is it's sodium. It's sodium ions. It's sodium <laughs> ions. That's right. It is attractive because it's cheap, or, but battery performance declines rapidly. Well, there is a problem. We've talked about it on the show. Yeah. There is a problem. These things don't last. Don't last. Yeah. That's the best way to describe Researchers it. Researchers have found the cause of the problem and a possible solution. Well, that's so they say, a possible solution. Possible solution. Well, for those who want to know, an ion is an atom or a molecule with a net charge. Right. Due to the loss or gain of one or more electrons. Yes, and okay. if you have sodium chloride, which is ordinary table salt in That's the water, sodium ions it and chlorine ion, ions. ionizes. So the sodium yep. chloride, when the salt is dry, is kind of glued together. Yep. And you have lots and lots of them, and they make little crystals. But when they get wet, those crystals break up, and the individual atoms in there part ways. They, the end, they do, huh? Yeah, you have sodium ions going around Floating and around. Chlorine, chlorine ions, ions going. Chlorine. There are other kinds of ions. For example, if you have potassium sulfate, the potassium is going to be the one ion, and the sulfate, which is is SO4, is going to be the other ion. The other side. So, well, this battery degradation that we just talked about, it intensifies with cycling Yeah. and at high temperature and with fast charging. Yeah. So they got to change. They got to. They got to figure out how They've to gotta fix They've got to figure this. it out. But they haven't solved it yet. Yes. But it when this ha when this gets solved, it doesn't mean that these batteries are necessarily going to go into cars. No, because, they're talking about all sorts of batteries. They're talking about energy storage. Yeah. The the um, sodium as a as a sodium is a small atom, 
but it's gigantic compared to lithium, which in turn is pretty big compared to hydrogen. Okay. So sodium, um, sodium batteries have got to have places for the sodium to link to, just like the lithium batteries have places for the lithium to link to. Okay. But in the sodium batteries, they are bigger. So the whole battery's got to be bigger because the uh -huh, atoms are bigger. I didn't bigger. know that. Yeah. It's a simple way of looking at things. and it's Well, not... there are a lot of very smart <clears throat> people working on this. A lot of very small people? Smart. Oh, I thought you said smart. <laughs> I was Some thinking, of them might be small. I, I was know. thinking, so, you know, <laughs> sodium isn't all that big compared well, to Well, it's a big things. problem. Yeah, it's, they it's got a, a lot problem. of people working on it. They will We've fix got, it. Uh, you know, I, I was looking at battery technology for an article for Green Energy Times. The numbers of different ways that we've got of sto storing things, I, I knew it was big. I got into it, and I realized that it was probably five times as big as I had thought. Of ways and, of storing oh, energy. Oh, it's, it's just unbelievable. Well, some of them are crazy. We run railroad cars uphill. Yeah. There's another one that, that takes boulders or takes uh, cinder blocks. Well, we talked about it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, we talked about one last week where, where when iron... When rust, when iron rusts, it gives off electrons. You give it electrons, it'll turn back to iron. Yeah, we talked about so that's exactly a that. Rust air, uh, iron air battery. Iron air battery. Okay, should we go on? Well, as I said, there are a lot of very smart people working on this. It will be solved. Too important to not be solved. Well, not only will it be solved, but it'll be solved six ways from Sunday. It, yes. It, we'll just have lots of solutions in not very many years. We've already got a lot of solutions. Okay, We've our next picture item. coming up here. We do. And it's hard to really see what's going on, but you look for the axe. And attached to an axe is a guy. Yeah, wearing, he's wearing, yeah. wearing a yellow parka. Yeah. And in the back is a fire. Yeah, and that is not the truck that's on fire. No, the truck's not on fire. The fire is behind the truck. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Climate change is turning California's wildfire season into wildfire year. No. We're going to touch base on this one again. We are. There is no wildfire season anymore in California. Like payphones, typewriters, and VCRs, a wildfire season is a thing of the past. We are seeing serious wildfires in the West throughout the year. Earlier spring and drier weather means that vegetation has more time to dry out. And uh, that's what it is. Well, wildfires are starting earlier in the spring and burning deeper into November, even into December and January. Right. It asks the question, is this normal? <laughs> and will wildfire seasons get worse? And there's a bunch of graphs in that article, and they look like they will. Okay, our next item is from Cheshire Live, and Cheshire in this case is from Eng is in England, and that picture is the pi is a picture Let's of the, the picture River up. Mersey. You remember a song called "Ferry Across the Mersey"? Well, it's very interesting you should say that because I heard that on WVPR yesterday. Oh, you're kidding me! <laughs> on all thing all the traditions. Well, you know the Beatles came from Liverpool, and the Mersey is the river. Is on the liver. Pool. That's right. The Mersey <laughs> runs runs past Liverpool, so it's a it's a. Well, it's kind of a bay. The Mersey is a big fat river. It's a big fat river. Yeah. When I was in in Europe in 1962, I came across some guys who say when you get said when you get back to England, you have to go to Liverpool, and see these guys. They're our friends. They're wonderful guys, and they they're just they're amazing musicians. And they were telling me about the Beatles. This was the Beatles before before anybody ever heard of them. Well, actually, the reason why it came up was because we were sitting in a youth hostel, and there was a there was a a jukebox there, and this kid who was, I think, Austrian, kept feeding the jukebox box and playing a piece of music called um, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Okay. And the Beatles were the backup players for it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and it was, you can still hear it. If you went to YouTube, you'd probably be able to hear My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Well, by whom? I don't remember. It was a guy that, who knew the Beatles, and he hired them to do the backup. To do the backup vocals. But, you know, this guy was just fascinated by the, by the music. Anyway, I never went to Liverpool, but there <laughs> it is. Okay. Um, Russia. No. Oh, the, the, Mersey. 
Mersey Tidal Project could be a renewable energy answer to the North needs. That's the North of England. That's the North of England. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is causing rising energy bills in the UK, a lot of places. The project on the River Mersey in Liverpool could be the answer uh, energy source we need to become self-reliant, reports the Liverpool Echo. Tidal power is more secure and a sustainable source of energy. It's also very predictable. Well, Russia, as you know, we've mentioned it, is the world's third largest producer of oil. Yes. And the second largest producer of natural gas. Yes. So they're right there in the middle. That's right. Energy from waves can be converted into power sources such as electricity. Right. In the Liverpool region, there has been discussion of a tidal project in the River Mersey. Mercy, which has a very large tidal range, okay, it goes up and down a lot. A massive renewable energy project in a, quote, liver pool, <laughs> <laughs> a tidal lagoon, could eventually generate enough clean energy to power a million homes. Yep. A Mersey tidal project could be up and running within a decade. Yes. I think it will. Yeah. I think it's a winner. I think that one that they were going to do in, in the south of Wales on the Severn estuary was also- That's gonna go, yeah. that's gonna go too. That, that had more or less- they, they both make a lot of sense fall economically. Fall sleep. Okay, our next one, we're up to Monday, March 28th. Well, we we a have picture a picture here. of the Feuerskogel wind farm. In um, Austria. In Austria, and that is an image by Bewa RE. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. <laughs> I think RE is renewable energy, but I might be wrong. Anyway, this is from Renewables Now. Renewables share in Austria stands at about 60% in February. Renewable energy covered about 60% of electricity needs in Austria in February as wind power generation more than doubled in annual terms. Thanks that's, to not, that's not the regular. This, no. That's special. Well, last, last year it was low, and this year it's high, so it doubled. Well, they had a lot of storms that, in yeah, February, and that's, that's what's right. doing it. Um, the Austrian power grid said this. The wind turbines provided nearly 18.5% of the country, country's electricity mix. Well, imports were 12%. Yeah. And the rest, which is nearly 30%, came from conventional sources. So they burnt something. Yeah. And the lack of transmission capacity is causing bottlenecks. Well, that's, that's happening everywhere. And in my opinion, the best solution for that is to have local generation everywhere. Distributed generation, Distributed which is generation. inevitably happening because it just makes sense. Yes. Well, Austria is planning to invest about 400 million U.S. dollars this year alone and 4 billion by 2032 to expand and upgrade the company's electric, the country's electricity infrastructure. Yes. So they're getting on top of things. Okay, we have an item from Republic World. We've got a picture here. We have a picture which is said to be deer near Chernobyl, but I don't know that that's really correct. Well, it's certainly deer. That's a magnificent duck, buck there, isn't yeah, it? it? Sure look at is. those antlers, huh? Yeah, look at those antlers. And a little Bambi in the middle. Little Bambi and Mama. Okay. Well, yeah, you can see in the background there's, there's, there's a structure in the back. Is there? Oh, yeah, I guess there is. Yeah. I, I hadn't seen it. looks like that. chimneys. They're a little bit too regular to be trees. Yeah. So let's see what it says. Forest fires spread to a 10,000 hectares around Chernobyl nuclear plant. And that's about six miles square. More than 10,000 hectares of forest are ablaze in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, posing a dangerous risk of nuclear wildfires. That means that things that are radioactive catch fire and the radioactive materials go up in smoke. Not healthy. Not healthy. Uh, a Ukrainian official warned, according to the Interfax agency, the fires could cause increased levels of radioactive air pollution in nearby countries. And by the way, there's a forest there called the Red Forest, which is a forest that is closed. You sh you nobody should go in there, there. It's, because it's, yeah. it's radioactive. And the Russian army went through that with its tanks oh and just kicked up dust like mad. Oh boy! And the people in the tanks and the people infantry they with them, read. they had no protection. Yeah. So they were breathing radioactive yeah. dust. Wow. <clears throat> well, for those who don't remember 
Chernobyl is the site of the world's worst nuclear meltdown back in 1986. Actually, I don't think it was. I think that the Fukushima's worse. But that's that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Chernobyl did more damage to more territory than Fukushima, for sure. Intense fires started within the last two weeks. Man. At least 31 areas near the power plant are now on fire. Yeah. And by the way, I don't know that that 10,000 acres is correct. Was it 10,000 acres or 10,000 hectares? It says 10,000 hectares. Hectares, which is 24,000 acres or something, something like that. Something like that. It's, but as they, as but I said, it's six miles I, by six I miles. I tried to verify that, and I found, I found very different figures in different places. Well, invading Russian troops attacked the nuclear facility on the very first day of launching a military operation. That's what you just said. They took control of the defunct power plant and disconnected its power grid from the world. Yeah. The power grid shut off, halted the cooling of nuclear material stored at the plant. Again, <laughs> what, what is going on in, in Vladimir Putin's mind? I don't think Putin knew what was going on. I don't think he would have made it go any differently if he did know what was going on, because I, I don't think he really cares about what's happening out in the field, just as long as it's as scary as possible. Well, as I said, the power shutoff halted the cooling of nuclear materials stored yeah. at the plant. Okay, we should go ahead, Tom, I think if we've you got to go ahead. We have an item yeah, from Mirage News, picture. and this is a cloud named Hector. And I want to point out, there is a map that's, we're looking at the map now, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, we are. And we I didn't go. use the maps that you sent me. And Tom wanted to see a map. And I didn't use them because I didn't know where they came from. And I do know where this came from. But um, let's look at Hector, if you don't mind, for a little bit. We got this, Hector. We got Hector. Looks like a, looks like a squirrel, doesn't he? A little bit. <laughs> but the, the reason this cloud is called Hector is because somebody had to name it because it's there every day. It's the same cloud? It's, same cloud? It's just there every day. You're it's, kidding me. That cloud was there during the Second World War, and, and avi aviators would use it as a homing beam. I never heard Th that story. They could see this thing. And a this cloud is, named Hector. And this particular cloud, you know, uh, uh, Darwin, is roughly the area where this um, submarine cable is going out to sea. Exactly. Okay. Let's, let's take a quick look at the submarine cable. There you Whoops. Whoop. There's the submarine cable, and you can see... It starts at Darwin, which is where Hector the Cloud is, and it goes a long way to Singapore. Singapore is on an island, as I recall. Very tip of an island. Yep, very tip exactly. of an island, but it is that thing that is up and to the left of it is part of Malaysia. And yes, that's, that is. is actually the Asian continent. So this is a very, very long, this thing says 4,200 kilometers. That's a couple thousand miles. Well, the whole thing is a couple thousand miles. Yeah. yeah. So, what do you have for and, a? And it's it starts at a uh, solar field. Yeah. What do you have for a ti for a title? Uh, what do I have uh, for a title? I bet you I could find that. And we have to go a little bit faster <laughs> because we're progressing the world's largest renewable energy system. The Northern Territory. Uh, labor government will introduce legislation to facilitate the $30 billion Sun Cable Australia Asia Powerlink project. That's $30 billion Australian dollars. And Australian yeah, dollars they're, almost, they're smaller. almost exactly 75%, 75 cents. The Sun Cable project is the world's sure. largest renewable energy transmission system. One part of it is the world's largest solar farm and battery. Well, the project will be a 3,000-mile transmission system to provide 800 megawatts of dispatchable renewable energy to supply Darwin and Singapore with re reliable and competitively priced renewable energy starting in 2026. And the project has a lifespan of more than 70 years, so it's going to be around for a while. It will be. Okay, we should go on. We're up to Tuesday, Tuesday March, March 29th, 29th, and we got a picture. And here. we have a picture of a mangrove forest. It and, certainly looks like a mangrove and, forest to me. You know, the, this is at low tide, so what you're seeing is all the roots and stuff from that, those mango trees. From those mango trees, and you can see why 
uh, when you have a when you have a, a hurricane or something like that, the floodwaters have to get through all of that stuff to get to the higher land. Yep. So this is a real effective barrier. And if this is from BBC. How do I get you up there? Oh, there you are. <laughs> do you really need to have me up there? <laughs> well, I did, but oh, okay. not anymore. Right. What is biodiversity and how are we project protecting it? World governments are meeting in China later this year to discuss how to stop human activities from causing the extinction of animal and plant species. They hope to come up with a long-term plan to reverse the threat. I want to point out it says reverse the threat to life on Earth in all its varieties at the UN Biodiversity Conference. Well, for what it's worth, biodiversity is the variety of all life on Earth. Yeah. Animals, plants, fungi, microorganisms like bacteria. Animals and plants provide humans with everything needed to survive, including water, food, and medications. Do you happen to know, is there such a good th a thing as a good virus? They I probably the are. There is a thing called a bacteriophage. Uh-huh. And it, it, is a, it is a virus that doesn't attack human beings or dogs or anything like that. It attacks bacteria. Interesting. And you, so, so it eats bacteria. Yeah, and there are, <laughs> there are bacteria that affect human beings that can be killed by bacteriophages. Well, this is interesting. 98% of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. 98%. 98. However, the extinction of species is now accelerating. Yeah. One in four species are now at risk, which includes us. <laughs> the yes. biggest threats are harvesting, logging, hunting, and fishing, according to the UN. Wow. Okay. Climate change is difficult for animals and plants to adapt to. Right. The yeah. UN says that species extinction would be lower if global warming was limited to 1.5 C. Yeah, I guess. And what is happening now is that there's a meeting to prepare the agenda and, and to talk, you know, the things that are going to be What's discussed. What's it going to talk about at the next meeting? At the next meeting, which is happening in China later on this year. Okay, the next item is from the BBC. We have a picture of a funny-looking guy here. Of your, your very good friend and my very good friend, that's a red leaf monkey. That's a red leaf monkey. Anybody is would it a red leaf it. monkey or a red leaf monkey? <laughs> <laughs> or a red leaf monkey? I don't know. <laughs> red leaf monkeys are red or orange anyway, and they eat a lot of leaves. Okay, this is from BBC. Pressure grows for a deal to save nature. Yeah, this says more about what we were just talking about. A global agreement to reverse the loss of nature and halt extinctions is inching closer as talks in Geneva enter their final day, which, of course, is already passed now. International negotiators are working on the, on the text of the UN framework to safeguard nature ahead of a high-level summit in China. Observers slammed the, quote, snail's pace, end quote, of negotiations. Well, scientists have issued warnings about threats to nature driven by human actions, including chopping down forests and turning over natural land to farming. Yeah. Okay, the vision is to live in harmony with nature. What's at stake is the future of the planet and its people. As and I said earlier, people. us. Yeah, that means us. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica. A nice picture here of a Starbucks. This is a, a picture Starbucks. of a Starbucks place. And uh, what do you have for a title? What's there that looks like a gas pump is not a gas pump. Yeah, it's a charger. <laughs> Why did it make chargers look like gas pumps? I don't know. Well, Starbucks charger. Starbucks wants to woo electric car drivers with more EV chargers. Most of the time. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, most of the time EV owners don't have to worry about charging. This is something most people thinking about this don't key in on. People plug their car in in the evening and they wake up in the morning with a car charged. So they don't have to go to a charger unless they're on a trip. Starbucks sees an opportunity to bring in customers who have to charge their cars while they're on those longer trips. Bingo. Bingo. I'm going to continue unless you've got more. No, I've lost my, my, my place here on a computer. Oh. There we go. There we go. There's Hector. <laughs> There's Hector. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it is now Tuesday, March 29th. No, We're having a good time. Wednesday, March 30th is the next one. It's the picture of... Well, a, we haven't even talked about the mangrove forest. Yes, we did. Have we? Yeah. 
And after that, we talked yes. about the monkey. And then after that, we talked about Starbucks. And now well, it's there's time. the monkey. Yeah, we did. You're ahead. Of, you're way ahead. Of, we, there's Starbucks. We and we're up about to Starbucks. Wednesday, we? March 30th, and we have an item from DW. And by the way, I missed this, but uh, Tad Montgomery sent a, an email to me about it. This one here? The one with the whale. A humpback whale? Yeah. The, that we're looking at. We're looking at. Hum, artificial, oh, who would have ever thought? Artificial <laughs> whale poop could save the planet. Yeah, who would Here's thought? how. Well, well they're going to answer that question. Just think about the different kinds of poop that you can make artificially. <laughs> Man, we've known that whale feces is good for marine life for more than a decade. In 2010, German whale scientist Victor Smetacek, uh, that's good. It doesn't sound like a German name to me. Discovered that whale poop is like agricultural dung, a fertilizer. Well, I could have told him that without even <laughs> looking. Whale poop turns out to be a vital part of the natural system that supports many life types. So if you want to have a rich environment in the ocean, you make sure that there's whales in there. Or come up with... Artificial imitation, poop. Imitation whale poop. Man. Which yeah. is... <laughs> imagine, imagine, you know, a, a little Joey goes to second grade and his teacher says, Joey, what does your father do for a living? <laughs> he makes, well, he whale makes poop. artificial whale poop. <laughs> <laughs> well, this fake poop consists of nitrates, phosphates, silicos, silicates, and iron created from natural materials like volcanic ash or desert. Yeah, well. Okay. Rice husks, which are a waste product, are used to store this artificial poop on the surface of the, the seabed. So it's, it's what they're doing works. Sounds silly to us, but it works. If you, if you get involved in fish and you look at the chain of things that they eat and yeah. so forth, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Because you have fish up at the surface, and they poop. And some fish down a little bit lower will eat that. <laughs> eat that. <laughs> and then he'll poop. And then some fish that's farther. Really, that's how it works. Let's move along. Let's yeah, let's get away from that. Look at an okay. airplane here. We have an airplane here. And this article is about a It's a firefighting airplane. It is. This article is about the drought in the United States. That plane is not in the United States, I happen to know, because I found it. Yeah, that is in Greece. Looks this like a seaplane. It is a seaplane. It is a seaplane. It's a seaplane that fights fires, which makes sense. This well, is there's a link to an extraordinary Antarctic heat wave, which is 70 degrees above normal. This time of year, well, the summertime this time of year, it is, it is summer down there. It's 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Normal temperature is minus 56. Where are you getting this? <laughs> it's from my notes. Oh, Two major factors contribute to the multi-year drought. Oh, we, we haven't read the, the regular stuff yet. Oh. Yeah, firefighting airplane, and under that, as drought pushes as, east. Okay. As drought pushes east, more intense wildfires are sparking in new areas. This year is already dr a dreadful year for wildfires. It's more, definitely dreadful. More than 14,781 separate wildfires have scorched over half a million acres so far. You know, that's a number so big that if somebody says how many have there been, mm -hmm. by the time you've pronounced it, there's probably there's more. been more. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the largest number of fires year to date, the um, National Interagency Fire Center has recorded in a decade and they are popping up farther east. And farther east, in this like case, Colorado means and Texas. Colorado and Texas, exactly. as opposed to California and places. Do you have more on that? Yeah, two major factors contributed. Lack of precipitation and increase in evaporative demand. Warmer temperatures increase the amount of water the atmosphere can absorb. Yes. Which then dries out the landscape. Yes. So drought, droughts that may have occurred only once every decade are now happening 70% more frequently, almost every year. Yeah. Okay, should we go on? We've got one more well, there's item. There's one interesting point here. On, on December 30th of, this, of just last year, the Marshall Fire in both Denver and Boulder burned down more than 1,000 homes in a matter of hours. They're not screwing around. No, this is, this is a serious problem. 
And it's going to get worse because that's the nature of this kind of problem. Yes, it will get until worse until we can figure out a way to deal with it. Well, they're going to burn out. They're going to burn down all of the fuel. <laughs> yeah, and and the thing is, what we have to do is we have to find a way to end the drought, which I think can be done. Well, I hadn't even thought about that. I had actually. I sent an, a message to my to a cousin who lives in California, and I said, you know. San Francisco is dumping 80 million gallons of, of, uh, of wastewater every day into the ocean. It's treated yes. enough that the ocean can take it. Why is it going into the ocean instead of being piped up the uh, uh, Sacramento piped River? Piped up the way growing things. And, and used Irrigate. to grow things, exactly. Yeah. I said, even if, even then, if all you then, did was... Then they won't be taking water out of the river, which, yeah, which even it, if, at times hasn't even reached Mexico. Even no, this is a Sacramento River. Oh, the Sacramento which goes River. down yeah, 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 past yeah, yeah. into into San Francisco. Well, Bay. the same thing's happening to the Colorado River. Absolutely, and the, you know, if you can, if you can, if you can move this stuff to a place where it'll settle into the aquifers and so forth, instead of just being in the it. ocean, yeah. you can I irrigate with it. Okay, our last item. We got a picture. We have a picture of a natural gas flare. Looks like a flare from. Um, uh, NASA, and if if a viewer is looking at this and saying that's just being burned, what are they doing with that? Well, they're bringing, they're burning the natural gas to get rid of it. Yes, exactly. And Be uh, I can tell you this: when I first flew into Saudi Arabia, yeah, I could look down on on Saudi Arabia and see flares all over the place. Yeah. When I left, it was almost unlefted because they, they were, were capturing capturing all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which, this which is, is encouraging. Yes, it is. This is from Clean Technica. Oil conglomerates made record profits in 2021. Huh? Yeah, right. Surging gas prices hurt working people just as 25 of the world's biggest oil fuel, uh, fossil fuel companies reaped a total of $205 billion no, in profits. No, they didn't do that. No, in two, 2021. It is no coincidence that the big profits came after shareholders pressured fossil fuel corporations to restrict supply in order to drive prices higher. Well, continued, despite repeated pledges to phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, U.S. oil and gas production continues to be subsidized by billions of dollars each year. Yeah. And they don't need them. They never. They, they, they haven't never, never for a have long, needed. long... I don't think they've needed them for 90 years. At least that. So, There's a link here, by the way. It's illegal in Texas to divest from fossil fuels. <laughs> so if you huh? <laughs> so if you own fossil fuel stock, it's illegal to sell it. <laughs> That's what it says. <clears throat> I didn't follow up. Yeah, on listen, the link. Tom. There was a law in Kansas. Yeah. This is my favorite law. There was it may may still be <laughs> a law in Kansas that said when two trains are stopped at a crossing. Neither one is uh, is allowed to start moving until the other one does. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> There's okay. books been written about crazy laws. Yes, there have been. Well, so we're what we're going to suggest to people is that they have a singularly uplifting week. Is that what it says? That's it says, what it, well, let me get it up there. So yeah, let's do that. that. Put that up, yeah. and then you can put the two of us up, and Bingo. we can wave goodbye. Have and a singularly, singularly uplifting week. We could we could do both at the same time. We could. If you double click on them, you you might be able to get that one over the other image thing. <laughs> you want to try that? Just double click. There you go. <laughs> By golly. <laughs> okay, Tom knows how to do that. So no, we'll, I say don't. <laughs> we'll say goodbye. I did it, but I don't know how. You double click on it. Uh oh, uh oh, there you go. There you go. That's us. That's us. Okay. Adios, amigos. Come back next time. Nice to have you. Y'all come back aboard. and see us now. You hear? Absolutely. <laughs>